An ideal regenerative Rankine cycle with an open feed water heater uses water as the working fluid. The turbine inlet is operated at 500 psi and 600 degrees Fahrenheit, and the condenser is operated at 5 psi. Steam is supplied to the feed water heater at 40 psi before being pumped and mixed with the feed water. Determine and complete the following. First, Y, the proportion of mass flow rate through the turbine that exits early to serve the closed feed water heater. Then the specific work in, that's relative to the cycle itself. Then, lastly, the thermal efficiency. Like our previous example, I'm going to try to identify two independent intensive properties about all nine of our stay points. The presence of the closed feed water heater means that I either have to pump my fluid back up to the high pressure before mixing, or use a trap or expansion valve to drop it back down to the low pressure before mixing. In either case, I'm going to have additional steps in the process. I have to have a separate place for the water to join back together, and that is essentially an open feed water heater in and of itself. It's just that the purpose isn't to actually accomplish any sort of heat transfer. The goal is just to allow the streams to mix together. So I have additional devices. That's why I have nine state points instead of seven. First, I recognize that I still have three pressures, and let's think through those together. Which stay points have the low pressure? That's right, eight, because it's the outlet of the turbine once it has expanded all the way, and one, because the condenser operates isobarically. And then the high pressure would be five and six, but the high pressure also includes four, nine, and two. Does that make sense? Because the mixing chamber has to occur isobarically, and the heat exchange process within the closed feed water heater also has to be isobaric. So that means the separate streams in the closed feed water heater, that's 7 to 3 and 2 to 9, are both going to be isobaric. So 2 is equal to 9, which is equal to 4, which is equal to 5. Therefore, the high pressure includes 6 and 5 and 4 and 9 and 2. That leaves us with 7 and 3 at the medium pressure. So pump 1 is pumping from the low pressure all the way up to the high pressure. 2 is just going from medium to high. So 9, 4, 5, 2, and 6 are high, 2, 4, 5, 6, 9. Then 8 and 1 are low. That leaves us with 7 and 3 as the medium pressure. Those pressures give me one half of my independent intensive properties required to get to all of the rest of the lookups. Next, I will consider the operation of the pumps and turbine. Because I was given no indication as to the operating efficiency of the turbine or the pumps, I will assume that they are occurring isentropically, meaning that they're 100% efficient so S2 is going to equal S1, S4 is going to equal S3, and S6 is equal to S7 and S8. That leaves me with four stay points unaccounted for. One of those is fulfilled by the temperature I was given at the inlet to the turbine. That would be stay point six, so I will say T6 is 600 degrees Fahrenheit, leaving me with three unaccounted for. The next one is easy. The condenser is assumed to only condense, so I assume that the outlet of the condenser is a saturated liquid, therefore I'm assuming x1 is zero. And similarly, I can assume that the closed feed water heater is allowing the stream at 7 to condense, and that's where it's getting its energy to push into the stream from 2 to 9. So the condensation of the steam is actually what's accomplishing the heating process, and I'm assuming that once it condenses, it leaves, because there's not enough temperature difference to really do a whole lot. So T3, nope. So X3 is also assumed to be 0. And again, I will indicate that that's an assumption that I'm making with an asterisk. So I have 5 and 9 unaccounted for. 
5 will come from an energy balance on the mixing chamber. Once I know everything about 4 and 9, knowing 5 is just a matter of combining the two, if I set up an energy balance on the mixing chamber, I recognize that it's assumed to be adiabatic, and there's no opportunities for work to occur. And if I neglect any changes in kinetic and potential energy, I will end up with the sum in of m dot h is equal to the sum out of m dot h, meaning m dot 9 h 9 plus m dot 4 h 4 is equal to m dot 5 h 5. If I know the proportion of mass flow rates at 9 and 4, I can calculate h 5. So I will just write h5 comes from energy balance on mixing chamber. And that leaves me with state 9. So the key to state 9 is similar to the assumption that we made about the operation of the regenerator back in the Brayton cycle. If we didn't have enough information to deduce otherwise, we assume that regenerator operated with 100% effectiveness, meaning as much heat as could be transferred was transferred. And back in that analysis, we had a heat exchanger where the flows were flowing in opposite directions. So a high temperature here was driven to a lower temperature here, and a high temperature here was driven to a lower temperature here, and if I were to plot out the position, let's call this hot in, hot out, hi ho, <laughs> cold in, cold out, co, seco. And then I am plotting temperatures relative to x position. And if I had the worst heat exchanger in the world, hot input would be here, cold input would be here and absolutely nothing would happen in between the two. So the temperature of C out would be the same as C in, and the temperature of hot out would be the same as the temperature of hot in. And if they were working just a little bit, then the change in enthalpy, which for air is directly correlated to a change in temperature, is the same in both the hot stream and the cold stream, meaning that I end up with lines that move up and down by the same amount. And if I were to extrapolate this to ideal circumstances, I end up with a line directly connecting the two. So for a heat exchanger with flows in opposite directions like this one, ideal operation is marked by the temperature of the cold outlet being the same as the temperature of the hot inlet, and the temperature of the cold inlet being the same as the temperature of the hot outlet. But our situation is different. In our situation, we have flows that are going more towards each other. So if I draw this as a box, I have the cold stream entering and then undergoing a whole bunch of surface area before leaving again. Let's stick with our naming convention here. That was C in and C out. And then hot in is steam. So we are spraying that all over these coils. It is allowed to condense and then leave. So if we're assuming that as much heat as can be transferred is transferred, then heat transfer will continue until the temperatures are the same. But here I'm not referring to the temperature of the inlet of one stream and the outlet of the other. No, I'm referring to the temperature of the two outlet streams. So, in conclusion, ideal operation of a closed feed water heater like this one is marked by the temperature of the outlet streams being the same. So the assumption I make about state point 9 is that it is the same as T3.
And with that, I have two independent intensive properties, which theoretically would define all nine state points, and looking up all my properties is just a matter of putting in the time. So in an effort to continue our analysis of the problem, before we get bogged up in the property lookups, let's assume that we had done that, okay? Poof, we have all nine enthalpies, or rather we have eight of them. What do we do with those enthalpies? Well, I want us to determine the specific work in, the specific Q in, the specific work out, and the specific Q out. Starting with work in, why don't you try that on your own first? What do you get for an equation for the specific work in to the cycle? Did you get 1 minus y times h2 minus h1 plus y times h4 minus h3? Excellent. Here we are defining 7, or rather the mass flow rate that leaves as 7 relative to 6 as y, and whatever remains, 1 minus y. So the proportion of the mass flow rate that leaves early m.7 over m.6 is defined as y, and whatever is left over is 1 minus y. So if 25% of the stream at 6 leaves at 7, the remaining 75% must leave at 8. Then I recognize that the mass flow rate at 6 is the same as 5, and those two state points are what I'm calling m dot cycle, the overall mass flow rate through my cycle. And that stream is split. Some of it goes into 8, 1, 2, and 9. And some of it goes into 7, 3, and 4. So in my workout equation, excuse me, in my work in equation, I'm taking the total power input and dividing by m dot cycle. The total power input is going to be the power input to both pumps. So the power input to pump one plus the power input to pump two, and the power input to pump one is going to simplify down to the power input is equal to the mass flow rate through pump one, which is either m dot one or m dot two times the quantity h2 minus h1. Therefore, I could write the power of pump 1 as m.1 times the quantity h2 minus h1. And then for pump 2, the power of pump 2 could be written as m.3 or 4 times the quantity h4 minus h3. Therefore, w.in is equal to m.1 times h2 minus h1 plus m.3 times h4 minus h3. And then I'm dividing that entire quantity by m dot cycle. And because m.1 divided by m dot cycle is the same as m.8 divided by m.6, that means I'm writing it as 1 minus y. And then because m.3 divided by m dot cycle is the same as m dot 7 divided by m dot 6, I'm writing that as y. So my equation should be 1 minus y times the quantity h2 minus h1 plus y times the quantity h4 minus h3. Then q in occurs in the boiler, and the boiler has the mass flow rate of the cycle. So q dot in divided by m dot cycle is going to simplify to m.5 times h6 minus h5 divided by m dot cycle, which is just 1 times the quantity h6 minus h5, which I can write as h6 minus h5. And then for our workout, if we set up an energy balance on the turbine, we're going to end up with the sum in of m dot h is equal to the power output plus the sum out of m dot h. Therefore, m dot 6 h6 is equal to w dot out plus m.7 h7 plus m.8 h8. And when I divide that entire quantity by m dot cycle, I'm left with h6 is equal to the specific workout plus y times h7 plus 1 minus y times h8. When I rearrange that equation to write specific workout, I should get the entrance h6 minus y times the first outlet minus 1 minus y times the second outlet. And then for Q out, I'm only analyzing the condenser because remember the mixing chamber and the closed feed water heater are assumed to be well insulated. Therefore, Q dot out would be M dot eight times the quantity H eight minus H one. Dividing that quantity by M dot cycle would yield M dot H over M dot cycle times 
h8 minus h1, which simplifies down to 1 minus y times h8 minus h1. So once again, I'm left with a relationship that is only a function of our enthalpies and y. So in order to be able to finish the problem, I have to determine y. And to do that, I'm going to need to perform an energy balance on a device about which I know everything. Because I don't know the work out that rules out the turbine, because I don't know Q out, I don't I can't analyze the condenser because I don't know the work in. I can't analyze either of the pumps because I don't know Q in. I can't analyze the boiler. That leaves me with the mixing chamber and the closed feed water heater. But remember, at this point in the analysis, we haven't yet figured out H5. We can do everything else, but we can't do H5. Therefore, the only device about which I know everything is going to be the closed feed water heater itself. So an energy balance on the closed feed water heater will yield Y, and then I can use an energy balance in the mixing chamber to determine H5, and then I can determine the specific work in, the specific Q in, the specific work out, the specific Q out, then I can determine the thermal efficiency, at which point I'm done with the question. So, energy balance on our closed feed water heater. And for that, I will draw a big vertical line. So that ended up being an awfully busy drawing, but the point is, we have a cool stream at 2 to 9 that is being heated up by the condensation of steam, which comes in at 7. And the result of that condensation leaves at state 8. If I set up an energy balance on this control volume, I have steady state operation of an open system, so I'm going to skip the first couple of steps and write e dot in is equal to e dot out. And then because it is an open system, the energy could cross the boundary as heat transfer or work. And because it is assumed to be adiabatic, I can neglect the heat transfers. I have no opportunity for work to occur, so I neglect the works. And remember that theta contains enthalpy, specific kinetic energy, and specific potential energy. And I'm neglecting changes in kinetic and potential energy, therefore I'm left with the sum in of m dot h is equal to the sum out of m dot h. And then I have entering mass flow rates in the form of states 2 and 7, so I can write that as m dot 2 times h2 plus m dot 7 times h7. And then I have exiting mass flow rates in the form of the other two states, 9 and 8? Is that 8? No, it's 3. Yeah, that's confusing. Let's correct that diagram I just drew. Okay. 2 comes in, 7 comes in, 9 goes out, 3 goes out. We got it. Okay. Then our sum out would be m.9 h9 plus m.3 h3. And you're expecting me to now divide by m dot cycle. And you're right, that would work. But before I do that, I can make my life a little bit easier by recognizing that m dot 2 and m dot 9 are the same, and m dot 7 and m dot 3 are the same. So if I bring them together, say by taking m dot 7 times h7 minus h3 is equal to m dot 2 times h9 minus h2. Now I have two fewer mass flow rates to have to deal with. So m.7 times h7 minus h3 is equal to m.2 times h9 minus h2. So I'm saying the energy absorbed by the cool stream is equal to the energy exiting the warm stream multiplied by mass to get rates. Cool. That all makes sense. Now I'm going to divide everything by m.cycle. cycle. And then I'll have m.7 divided by m dot cycle, which is the same as m.7 divided by m.6. So that simplifies to, because I want to know, <laughs> 
for that joke to work, you had to say it all loud. I just operate under the assumption that you are all participating audibly in those rhetorical questions that I ask you. And then m.2 divided by m. cycle is equal to m.8 divided by m.6, which is 1 minus y. And then you know it's time for algebra to solve for y. So I'm going to foil the right-hand side first. I don't really know why I'm narrating. You guys can probably figure out what I'm doing, but here I am. Minus first, outside, minus h2. Inside, minus y times h9. Last, plus h2 times y. That's equal to y times h7 minus y times h3. Now I want to get all the y's together. So I'm going to say y times the quantity h7 minus h3 plus h9 minus h2. y times the quantity h7 minus h3 plus h9 minus h2. I don't know why I'm still narrating my algebra. If I hadn't spoken, I could have time-lapsed this. But you know what? It's fun to do algebra together. Then solving for y yields h9 minus h2 divided by the quantity h7 minus h3 plus h9 minus h2. And 9 minus 2, full stream divided by 7 minus 3, plus 9 minus 2. Yep, I'm cool with it. So at this point in our analysis, if we had looked up all of the enthalpies except for state 5, I would have enough information to calculate y, and then armed with our new y, I could calculate H5 by performing an energy balance on the mixing chamber. I think I can fit that in here. I have entering mass at state, let's double check this time as opposed to resorting to memory, 9 and 4, 9 and 4. And it's leaving at 5. And the mixing chamber itself is adiabatic and has no opportunity for work. So if I were to set up the worst control volume ever, <laughs> perform an energy balance on that control volume, because it's steady and it's open, and I'm neglecting changes in kinetic and potential energy, and there are no opportunities for heat transfer or work, I'm going to do one, two, skip a few, all the way down to the sum in of m dot h is equal to the sum out of m dot h. I have one exiting mass, two entering masses. So m dot nine, h nine, plus m dot four, h four, is equal to m dot 5 h5. Therefore, I'm going to get rid of this page count. Therefore, h5 is equal to, that's not what I wanted, red for some reason. h5 is equal to m dot 4 h4 divided by a m dot 5 plus, it looks a little bit too much like a 9, so I'm going to correct that. That's a much better 4 while we're at it. Yeah, good fours. That is a good four, absolutely nothing. Say it again. And H5, okay. And if you expected me to have divided by m dot cycle, I mean, what I did was solve for H5 by dividing both sides by m dot five, which is also equal to m dot cycle. So it's essentially the same thing anyway, which is fun. So to four divided by m dot five is equal to m dot 7 divided by m dot 6, which is y. So this is y times h4. And then m dot 9 is equal to m dot 8. And then m dot 9 divided by m dot 5 would be equal to m dot 8 divided by m dot cycle, which is 1 minus y. 
and that gives me everything I need to calculate H5. So let's recap our outline for the moment. We are going to look up H1, H2, H3, H4, H6, H7, H8, H9, and then we're going to use our energy balance on our closed feed water heater to determine Y, and then we are going to use our energy balance in the mixing chamber to determine our H5, and then once we have Y and all nine H's, we are going to calculate the specific work in, the specific Q in, the specific work out, and the specific Q out. And again, because this is a Thermo 2 example problem, and I'm assuming that you guys are good at property table lookups, I'm not going to waste any more example problem time looking up the properties on camera. Instead, we are just going to jump to having all of the enthalpies except for state 5. Are you ready? Here we go. 3, 2, 1. And with that, we have 8 of our 9 enthalpies. Again, I included my work in full detail here on the attached pages, so if you download the PDF below this video, you can follow along with the lookups if you want to try them on your own, and I would encourage you that you do. And then our next step is going to be to calculate Y from knowing H9, H2, H7, and H3. So I'm going to take 9 minus 2, which is going to require our calculator friend. 9 minus 2, 237.35 minus 133.27. And then we are dividing that quantity by another quantity, 7 minus 3, that's 1055, nope, 1085.02 minus 3 was 236.16. And then plus 9 minus 2 plus 237.35 minus. 133.27. That gives us a y value of 0 0.10922. And armed with our new y, we now have everything we need to calculate h5 with the exception of a little bit more space. So I'm going to take that Y value times H4. Oh no, I moved the white that I had used to block out the page number. That's interesting. Anyway, so Y times H4, which was 239.2, and I'm adding to that one minus Y. It's not minus calculator. Come on, you're better than this. Times H5, which was... Wait, times H5? What? 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 Four and nine. What am I doing? I remember I was making a joke about the song War sounding like the song Four. So I'm multiplying by H9, not H5. And that H9 value was 237.35, and that would be 237.552. It's useful at this point to sanity check that number. We are mixing together the streams at 4 and 9. So our state 5 should be somewhere between states 4, state 4's enthalpy, and state 9's enthalpy. So it should be somewhere between 239.2 and 237.35. Since our y value is so small, I should expect a number that is so much closer to H9 than it is to H4, because I'm taking a bigger quantity times H9 plus a smaller quantity times H4. That's why our value of 237.552 being so close to 237.35 compared to 239.2 is such a good sign. And now I have all nine of my enthalpies. So I have everything I need to be able to continue, I will calculate the work in, the Q in, the work out, and the Q out, which I will do first by scooching some stuff around. What did I do? What? How did I break? Okay, let's try that again. Which I will do by scooching some stuff around, hopefully correctly this time. And that is probably enough space to finish the problem. 
So 1 minus y times h2 minus h1. So 1 minus y times h2 minus h1, 133.27 minus 130.17 plus y times h4 minus h3. h4 minus h3 was 239.2 minus 236.16. And I get a work in of approximately 3. Next is Q in, which is easy. That's just 6 minus 5. So I take 1298.3 minus 237.552. I get 1060.75. Just occurs to me now how many decimal points I used on work in. But you know what? We're into it already. So let's just continue. Then I'm taking 1298.3 minus Y times h7 and h7 was 1085.02 minus 1 minus y times h8 which is 954.18 giving me 329.83 and then after such complicated calculations such as work in and work out Q out should be a breeze. I'm taking 1 minus y times h8 minus h1. So 9 by 4.18 minus 130.17, which gives me 734.012. And with those quantities, I have enough to calculate the network out, the net heat transfer in, and then the thermal efficiency. So first up, I have work out minus work in, which is 329.83 minus 3.09345 according to my work that is 326.736 and then I take 1060 and I divide by 734 and I get 326.736 as well again those values being the same implies that I built my equations for work in Q and work out in Q out correctly which is a little bit more reassuring as they get more complicated and then 326.736. That leaves us with thermal efficiency, which is 326.736, divided by Q in, which was 1,000 and change. And I get 30.8%. So if I were to pose the question, how does this efficiency compare to the previous problem's efficiency? Well, it seems like they're pretty close to the same, right? 30.83 compared to 30.80. But our thermal efficiency in the closed feed water heater is reflective of the differences between the two types of regenerative Rankine cycles. Closed feed water heaters are always going to be less efficient than open feed water heaters. That might cause you to ask yourself, why then would anyone ever use a closed feed water heater? They're, they're more mechanically complicated, they're less effective, why would I want one? Well, when we are talking about different ways of implementing a regenerative Rankine cycle, the advantage of the closed feed water heater is that you can accomplish the overall cycle with fewer pumps. So if I were to expand the stream from 7 to 3 back down to the low pressure and mix it together with the stream at 1 minus y and have them compressed in a single pump, I would save money on pumps and the cost savings might be enough to offset the slight drop in thermal efficiency with a closed feed water heater, especially when we start to encounter effectiveness of the feed water heater. 
because it's real easy to build an effective open feed water heater. It's not particularly easy to build an effective closed feed water heater to the same level. But that savings might offset the increased cost of complexity and the slight loss of thermal efficiency. The last thing I want us to do is to draw a TS diagram of this cycle. For that, I'm going to start with the same axes and saturation lines as the previous example. Nope. Third time's a charm. And on this expertly drawn TS diagram, I am going to indicate three lines of constant pressure. One low pressure, one medium pressure, and one high pressure. And of course this is hugely exaggerated because the goal of this diagram is just to indicate rough shape. What I'm looking for is the positioning of our state points relative to one another. And I begin by recognizing that states 1 and 3 both had assumed a saturated liquid. So 1 and 3 are going to be here and here. That was state point 3, right? Yep. And then 2 and 4 are going to be directly above them. And I'm going to draw this in black to hopefully draw a little bit more contrast. And then... Two and four. And then again, I have six, seven, and eight, all in a nice little column here. So then the remainder of our state points, and then for the remainder of our state points, we're just going to be looking at this region up here. And I got a little bit overconfident when I was drawing my state points here. Two is not on the medium pressure, two is on the high pressure. Because again, one to two is going all the way up to the high pressure. So I'm left with 5 and 9, and 9 and 5 are both going to be on the high pressure line. They are just going to be between 4 and 2. So I will draw that like this. So 2 gains a little bit of energy to 9, 4 and 9 mixed together to yield 5. 5 follows a constant pressure process up to 6. 7 comes back to 3 before going up to 4. 8 comes back to 1. And there's our TS diagram for this cycle. If we were to analyze this problem in MATLAB instead of performing the calculations by hand, we end up with something that looks like this. So. MATLAB is running through the calculations that we had done by hand using XSteam to perform all the property lookups, and then determining Y using our values for enthalpy, calculating a specific work in, specific Q in, a specific work out, and a specific Q out, and then calculating a thermal efficiency. MATLAB also has the benefit of being able to plot the TS diagram accurately. So on this TS diagram, everything is actually to scale. I will point out that in my drawing, we had exaggerated everything 
in the compressed liquid region so as to actually indicate how the state points lie relative to one another. But in the compressed liquid region, the lines of constant pressure appear so close together that they are essentially inseparable when we're looking at an actual graph. So when we look at the MATLAB code, it's impossible to differentiate those isobars in the compressed liquid region and those state points over here referring to 2, 9, 5, and 4 appear all on top of one another. Another advantage of performing this calculation in MATLAB is that it allows us to perform changes to our given information and see how that affects the results. I could say, consider the regenerator pressure and ask the question, what happens if the regenerator pressure is changed from 40 to 50? We could change it to 50 and watch how this changes. Our thermal efficiency went from 31 on the nose to 31.07 we saw that it increased. And if I wanted to, I could wrap this code in a loop and have it perform the calculation, oh, I don't know, maybe a thousand times, and graph the results. This takes a second because it has to do a lot of calculations. Here, let me make that figure a little bit bigger, so hopefully it's easier to read. Bring it over. So on this figure, I'm showing thermal efficiency as a function of regenerator pressure in the center, we can see that the optimum thermal efficiency is going to occur at a regenerator pressure of, I don't know, maybe 80 or 90 PSI. And then on the left graph, I'm showing how Y changes as a function of regenerator pressure. So we can't just have a Y value of 0 0.8. It is a function of the pressure at which we are extracting the steam. And then on the right graph, I'm just plotting thermal efficiency as a function of that Y value. So the Y value corresponding to a regenerator pressure that yields the highest thermal efficiency is about 0 